Today I want to talk to you about a new kid on the block in the world of virtual reality headsets. It's from a company called DPVR and it is the E4. Now DPVR as a company up to this point have been primarily enterprise focused and this is their first entrance into the consumer facing market. Do we really need another VR headset in the market right now? Well I think the answer is yes, particularly at the mid price point. Yes, we've got the likes of the Vajo Aero at US 2000 plus and just coming into the market now, the Pimax Crystal at 1500 US plus. But we don't have very much at all for that mid market, which I'm going to say is between 500 and 800 US dollars. And this headset is going to fit directly into that category. Now, currently for us simmers, that is dominated by the HP Reverb G2 at about 600 US dollars. But who knows what the future for that headset will hold as there's a lot of speculation in the market right now in terms of whether HP are going to stay in the VR market or the consumer VR market. The best selling headset at the moment is the Quest 2. And I think that this product is aimed at the Quest 2 but with a few modifications. One, it's not trying to be a standalone VR headset. It is designed from the ground up as a PC VR headset. And it has a display port, giving it an advantage over the Quest 2, although it has exactly the same resolution, in that it can transfer the data faster than the Quest 2's HDMI, and therefore improve visual fidelity and possibly performance. So the big question is, can this new headset live up to the promise? Well, in this video, we're going to find out. Welcome to the Sim Hangar. My name's Mark. Thank you very much for watching. And let's get started. The unit is very well packed. And inside the box, in addition to the headset, you get two controllers. Each take a single AA battery. Battery is not included. And in the box are your connection cables and power supply. My unit arrived with an American plug on it. No adapters are included, but this may be because I ordered it direct from Amazon UK, but was fulfilled by Amazon USA. This was not a review unit. I ordered it in a personal capacity and paid for it. This headset is very light as it doesn't require any battery because it's PC VR and features the halo strap design and flip up, something we've seen before, but not for quite some time. The flip-up design making it easier to pop in and out of VR. The hinge mechanism seems fairly robust and the unit is made out of a flexible light plastic. It features Fresnel lenses with a single LCD display panel with a combined resolution of 3664 by 1920. Exactly the same as the MetaQuest 2. The face gasket itself is very light indeed and very thin. Not designed to offer any support to your face, but function purely as a light blocker. It's held in place by these small rubber protrusions, as opposed to the traditional magnetic design. This is something I haven't seen before. Strikes me as somewhat of a cost-cutting measure, and I'm not a fan. Unlike the face gasket, the actual halo strap itself has plenty of padding, with what feels like a foam support, and of course it's velcroed, so it can be removed for easy cleaning. What is interesting is there's a junction box on the short lead coming from the headset itself. I stand to be corrected, but I don't think we've seen this since the HP Reverb G1. Although the way it connects looks far more robust indeed. The head strap itself can be adjusted using the dial to vary the size of the halo strap itself. Something very common in VR headsets and becoming a standard. A welcome addition is a top strap. Again, it's a rubberized or silicon material, very stretchy. It's quite thin and something I was somewhat skeptical about, but having used the headset for a couple of days now, I found it fit for purpose. The headset has a built-in microphone that we'll be testing later on, and for tracking has four built-in cameras, two forward-facing and two to the side. Putting some of the unique design characteristics aside, the overall feel and look and quality of the unit itself Whilst being fit for purpose, there's not in my opinion quite up there with HP Reverb or Quest 2. 
Anybody that's used the Quest 2 controllers previously will be at home with the E4 controllers. They're very similar indeed. Although the buttons and joysticks are much closer together, I found them comfortable and easy to use. Those individuals with larger hands may have a different experience. For a controller, the quality is fine and as I mentioned previously, it takes one AA battery. And whilst I've used the headset for probably 8 to 10 hours, I haven't used the controllers that much so not sure how long the batteries will last in day-to-day -day use. Turning now to the cables that you get with the unit, first of all the power supply. The unit does require its own feed. The lead is about 3 meters long, so plenty of cable. The voltage usage is regulated, so fine for use in the US as well as in the UK at 240 volts, etc. And now on to the more interesting aspect in terms of cables for this headset. The main cable is of a good quality, flexible and enough to do its job. One end of the cable has the Oculink, same as the Valve Index. Nothing to do with Oculus, by the way. And this connects to the junction box on the lead from the headset. It's a tight, solid fit and can be secured in place with the screws. And I'm guessing they didn't want to make the mistake that HP made with the HP Reverb in the early days. But of course, once connected, it adds to the weight of the pull on the headset. And whilst not massively heavy, it is noticeable. And also on the cable is a clip. This is to allow you to attach it to something to take some of the weight so the movement of the headset whilst in use is not restricted. On the other end of the cable is another junction box. This is where the power supply is connected to. And out of the junction box, it splits into a USB and DP port connector. The cables are relatively short, so connection to the back of the PC is likely to be the most practical. But the weight of this additional junction box will not be a factor and won't affect the use of the headset. The headset itself is fairly small in size and this is it compared to my Pico 4. They're very much of a similar size overall. A quick look at the published technical specs for this headset confirms the resolution is exactly the same as the MetaQuest 2. In terms of IPD adjustment, and we'll be covering this in more detail later on, it has one of the widest ranges available from 54 to 74 mm and the controllers have haptic feedback. For the connections, it's DisplayPort 1.4 and USB 3. The headset actually boasts three refresh rates, 72, 90 and as shown here, 120 Hz. And your preference can be set manually for this headset depending on your hardware available. But just a note that if you've got an AMD GPU, only the 72 and 90 is currently available. For whatever reason, the AMD cards are not supporting the 120Hz rate. For a headset of this type, it also boasts a fairly wide FOV of 116 degrees. I'm not able to confirm that from a technical standpoint, but it's certainly considerably larger than the HP Reverb G2 and the Quest 2, but is considerably smaller than something like the Valve Index. Because of the design of this headset, your eyes are closer to the lenses than in many other headsets, and to some degree this may account for the larger FOV in terms of specifications. On their website, and I'll leave links in the notes below, their published minimum specifications for the PC are shown above. However, this review is not focused on general gaming, but on flight simulation and Microsoft Flight Simulator in particular. So I would suggest a GTX 1060 is not up to task. And I would peg the minimum at something like a 2080 Super or an RTX 3070 or similar, 16GB of RAM and an i7 or i9 CPU. To install the headset, you're required to download the DPVR Assistant 4, and this will guide you through the whole setup process. It's fairly quick and easy to follow. It includes both text and voice instructions. It's aimed at those that are not familiar with VR setups. This is how it should be done and other VR companies could learn a thing or two here. In order to download and execute the install, you will need to disable your antivirus protection. One of the reasons the install is so quick and easy is this headset doesn't come with its own store or link you to a DP VR home or anything like that. It's purely a Steam VR headset 
and so it's compatible with all Steam VR games out the box, and you can run Windows Mixed Reality applications by using the free Steam add-on, Steam VR for Windows Mixed Reality. As part of the install, it'll check that your PC meets the minimum specifications, and then it will start the install process. You can choose where on your system you'd like it installed. The install process itself takes a couple of minutes, and then it'll bring you to a login option. And here you have a number of options, but unlike the Quest 2, etc., you can opt to sign in just using your email, or alternatively, you can just use the visitor mode without entering any data at all and continue. Then it's just a simple case of following the instructions. It will guide you through what to connect and when, and as it does so, it will verify connections are good or otherwise. As mentioned previously, it does offer a number of different refresh rates, with the restrictions previously noted. For my test today, I've opted for the 120Hz refresh rate, as today I'm using it with my RTX 3090. It'll verify connection for the controllers, simply move them to activate, and then you need to set up your tracking. And this is where I initially ran into a problem. And to cut a long story short, you need to make sure that the room is well lit. As in my experience, the sensors are very, very sensitive, far more so than other VR headsets I've experienced in terms of light requirements. Here in the UK, it was a damp and somewhat overcast day, one small light on in the office I was in, and it just would not pick up the head tracking. I had to add more light, and we were away. This here is my rather poor attempt at some through-the-lens footage in Half-Life Alex. I think what it does highlight is how good the graphics are, but I'm showing you this to highlight a potential issue with the tracking. The room I'm in is moderately well lit, and whilst I found the tracking of the headset to be fairly good, once I'd finished setup, I did experience some erratic behaviour from the controllers. There, did you see that jump? That wasn't me moving my hand. That was the loss of tracking of the controller itself. Now in Flight Sim, that's not a major issue, as by and large most of us don't tend to use our controllers, but it is a point I wanted to highlight. DPVR will be able to improve tracking through firmware updates, but at the time of testing, it's not up to standard. The DPVR E4 headset does not have any manual IPD adjustment. The image is digitally manipulated within the software. The default is set at 64mm, my IPD is about 61, and you can change the IPD in the system settings at any time. I personally prefer a manual adjustment, but I was able to adjust my IPD and get a good image. How well this would work at the extremes of IPDs in the 50s and perhaps in the 70s, I don't know, I haven't been able to test that. Okay, so we're going to jump into Sim just now and give it a test. But first of all, a couple of things I want to cover off. Um, the first one is that um, the design itself is somewhat retro. I quite like it. And I don't know if this will come out on the video, but there's a little bit of a Knight Rider thing going on there with the LED light just streaming across the front there. I quite like it. When you first get this headset and put it on, a couple of things you'll notice. One is the weight of this junction box. It's quite heavy. Um, and once it's on your head and you're moving around, you can feel the weight of this. And that's obviously why they've put this clip on here, um, so that you can attach it to your shirt or your trousers or maybe even your chair to try and ease some of that movement. So that's not great. I must say. In terms of fitting the headset itself, because it's a halo um, type strap, the face of or the faceplate of the VR headset is not designed to fit fast and, and firm against the front of your face, but more or less hang in front of it. So fitting it is very important because this face gasket here is very very thin indeed there's no padding of any kind and if you get your nose up against the lenses here well that's going to be very uncomfortable very quickly so to fit it correctly using the convenient flip up place it over the face and then we're going to pull it back and you'll pull it down probably a little further than what you would expect or what you would do with other headsets 
and you're pulling it just past the little bump in your head and pull it, and pull it right down so it literally is just hanging now because i'm wearing glasses um, i'm getting a little bit of light leakage here i've tried it without glasses on and i'm not getting any light leakage there but there is a little bit through the nose here but it's not too distracting overall because i wear glasses um, and because this padding is so soft and so giving that my glasses are more or less right up against the lenses and right off the bat i've got to say that if you wear glasses as it is right now i can't recommend it it's not really designed for those that wear glasses third party um, prescription lenses inevitably will come out for this product and then that would be a solution but wearing glass standard size glasses with this headset is 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 not not a great or a particularly comfortable experience because your lenses are going to be right up against the lenses and potentially scratch them over a period of time and so on so. okay let's now jump into sim we're going to go for a short flight over tokyo in japan i've selected this area as it's a good stress test due to the number of 3d objects different terrains water reflections over an extended distance Hello guys, welcome to Tokyo and uh, to VR. Just uh, an explanation on my settings. I am recording using the Steam Mirror. So you are seeing what I'm seeing and not just a direct recording off the screen. So the chances are it's going to be a little bit jerky. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, if it's jerky in the headset while we fly, I'll let you know. Um, the sweet spot is certainly larger in this headset than what it is in something like the HP Reverb G2. It's not massive, but it's, it's substantially larger, so far easier to get your eyes just in the right position. My settings are a mixture of... Uh, um, ultra, high, and medium for VR, um, my normal VR settings basically, and I am using the OpenXR toolkit. I've increased the sharpness and the resolution uh, just to get the best out of the headset, and uh, the colors are good. Um, they're pretty vibrant. There's a little bit of washout, but that's to be expected with an LCD screen. Um, and I'm not getting much shimmering. I'm getting a little bit just where the grass ends and the apron starts. I'm getting a little bit of shimmer there. But other than that, nothing major. And as you can probably tell, I'm using the microphone that's built in. So I hope that comes out all right. So let's take the Cessna Caravan up and uh, give it a spin and we'll see how we do. Here we go. And the first thing I can tell you is the sound is absolutely terrible. It's appalling. Very light, very tinny, no depth whatsoever to the sound. That's a shocker. I've used many headsets over the years, and I think that without doubt, this one has the privilege of being singularly the worst. Just adjust my prop, come back. We don't need to climb very high today. And we're gonna put it on autopilot as soon as we're practically able to do that so that we can chat. Now this may be coming out a little bit jerky, guys. If that's the case, as I said, I apologize. But in the headset, I can tell you it's absolutely super smooth. No problems at all. I can read the instruments. I am on DLSS, so I need to lean forward slightly in order to read them, but not too bad. I have tried this on TAA, and uh, it's certainly uh, much, much clearer than it is on the Quest 2. The one thing I note is that this headset gets uh, very hot very quickly. Uh, the fans are whirring away, but with the sound such as it is, 
I can't hear the, the fans going. The performance in the headset is very good. It's super smooth. Because my eyes are so close to the lenses, I am conscious and I can see the ends of the lenses here, just where like a black border. My brain will soon click in and I won't see that, but because I'm doing the test, I am very conscious of that. We're now coming up on to Tokyo proper. Performance has remained uh, good. The FOV, um, it's certainly considerably larger than what it is with the HP Reverb G2. Um, probably on a par with the Pico 4, I would guess. Colors are still good and images are relatively crisp for the resolution. Definitely better than the Quest 2. Well, we've now passed our first waypoint. We're now heading over the bay and towards some of the landmark bridges. I don't feel that with the sound as it is that headphones are optional. I think they are a prerequisite for this headset because the poor sound in itself is a huge immersion breaker. The tracking is quite sensitive, particularly if you're in some ambient light. Um, it does lose its tracking fairly quickly. It's far more sensitive than HP Reverb G2. Um, and I'm not just talking about controller tracking, I'm talking about the head tracking itself. It seems oversensitive. Okay, let's move on to my final thoughts and opinions on the DP VR virtual reality headset. It's clearly been designed to take on the likes of the Quest 2 and uh, Pico 4, but with the added advantage of having a display port and the improved graphics fidelity that that will bring. Unfortunately, however, I think that at the price point, it's missed the target. Let me tell you why. First of all, the Quest 2 is currently selling for about $100 US cheaper than the list price for the DP VR headset, which is about $450 US. It's also about $50 US cheaper than the HP Reverb G2. However, this face gasket is not the final solution, I would suggest, and you're going to spend more money on a third-party face gasket to improve the comfort and the fit levels. The sound, as I mentioned, is absolutely awful, so it doesn't come with its own sound. Uh, that is acceptable. You're going to have to use headphones with it, and arguably that's another cost, whereas the HP Reverb does. So in terms of overall cost, in reality, it's going to cost you as much as the HP Reverb. In fact, looking online today in the States, at the time of recording this video, the HP Reverb G2 is going for 449. So again, 100 US cheaper than what this is currently going for. It does have a number of positives in addition to the improved graphics. The performance is pretty good and it is a Steam VR non-fussy headset and the DP VR does what it says on the tin. It's got a pretty reasonable FOV and according to the specs, although I haven't been able to test it myself, a pretty wide range, a wider range of IPD adjustment than most other headsets, going from something in the region I think it's 54 to 74. On the negative side, however, there's quite a lot, unfortunately, that we've got to talk about. One, if you wear glasses, as it is right now, it's not suitable. Um, you're going to scratch the lenses. Your eyes are going to be right up against um, the lenses themselves, which in itself is not a great thing. The tracking is very sensitive to light. And whereas most VR headsets will operate their controllers in moderate light, no major problems, this one is far more fussy and you're prone to get jumping in the controllers. 
the fan. I can hear it right now. You probably can't hear it. Um, but the fan runs constantly. The headset does get very hot very quickly. And when you switch down, the fan stays on for an awful long time. I don't know how long I've left it for up to about an hour or so, uh, but the fan was still running it. Now, both the fan and the tracking issues uh, can be resolved through firmware updates. So I'm sure DPVR will be addressing that um, as time goes by. Overall, in terms of the comfort, well, there are better headsets out there. And in my personal opinion, the Quest 2 and certainly the HP Reverb G2 are far more comfortable than this. We've talked about the sound. You don't get any usable sound with this headset. Um, and the cable itself is very, very heavy indeed. IPD is only software adjustable. How big an issue that is for you will depend just how far your IPD is out of the average range of probably 63 or 64 millimeters. And of course, AMD, if you're running on an AMD chip, while well, currently the 120 hertz option is just not available to you. So overall, for 549, or if you're in the UK, um, thanks to Brexit and you import it, it's going to cost you about £620. By the time you finish paying duty and uh, VAT and everything, I can't recommend this headset. Um, it does not represent adequate value for money. Maybe if it was 399 or maybe even the same price as the Quest, it might be a slightly different story. But this has been made to a price point and there are just too many compromises. So overall, my final recommendation as it stands today is avoid. As always, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you found this useful and informative. Stay well, look after yourselves. I'll see you all again very soon. And bye for now.